Um, welcome back for the second of our six um, Marine Science in the Mornings webinars. Um, today we have uh, Dr. Alyssa Demko with us. Uh, Alyssa is a postdoctoral researcher here at the Smithsonian Marine Station. She's been with us since April 2021. Um, originally from Connecticut, she did a BS in Marine Bio and Chemistry at Roger Williams University. And then that followed that with a, a Master of Science in Marine Biology from College of Charleston. And then she did her PhD at uh, Scripps in Marine Biology, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is a uh, University of California. Um, with that, I will go ahead and have Alyssa share her screen and we will get started. All right. Uh, Alyssa, sorry, let me interrupt real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Just as a reminder, if you have questions, uh, those attended last week heard me say, put them in the chat, but that was a mistake. If you have questions that you'd like answered, we have two people on hand who will be answering questions, uh, Dr. Jenny Sneed and Dr. Uh, Val Paul, and you, those can be entered in the Q&A and the answers will be posted in the Q&A as well. So thank you. And uh, Alyssa, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Branson. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and I'm pretty excited to share the research I've been doing while at the Smithsonian looking at microbes and coral larvae, and in particular using bacteria to enhance coral restoration efforts. So as Branson mentioned, I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Smithsonian Marine Station in Fort Pierce. We are part of the Museum of Natural History. And much of our research focuses on biodiversity and ecosystems in Florida. Oops. One of those ecosystems and the ecosystem I work in is pictured here. So if we think about the coral reefs of Florida, hopefully people who have been on the coral have been able to snorkel or swim around these beautiful environments. Uh, coral reefs in general are incredibly important ecosystems. They are the rainforests of our ocean. So despite the fact that they you know, are about 1% of the entire ocean floor, they actually support about 25% of the marine life. Uh, they are also incredibly economically important. I believe the Florida coral reefs alone contribute about $8 billion to our economy. So if we think about things like fisheries, ecotourism, as well as protection from, you know, coastal erosion and hurricanes and the like. I think this photo does a good job of illustrating some of the diversity present on reefs within Florida. So if you've snorkeled or scuba dived at the Keys, hopefully you've been able to see some of these organisms. And if you're just looking at this image now, you might be able to pick out quite a variety, right? So there's a couple different kinds of fish that are visible in the photo. There's different types of corals. So these hard stony corals that are more structured versus soft corals that might be flowing uh, like sea fans in the background. Uh, you might also see some sponges or some algae. And of course the person that's in this photo, right? There's also a wide variety of critters. And if you've been walking around the aquarium today or you know been out looking on the reef before, there are a lot of things you probably can't see right away, but if you were there live, you might be able to spot some smaller organisms, smaller fish, invertebrates like shrimp. And of course, what's present throughout this entire photo and is my area of interest is not something we can easily see, but something that requires a microscope. And that of course, is microbes. So microbes are absolutely everywhere in this photo. When I say microbes, I'm predominantly going to be talking about bacteria, but it also includes things like protists and uh, fungi and viruses. So they are in the water column of our oceans. They are on every surface in this image. So if we think about the corals, we think about the human, and they are inside their tissues as well. So right, us humans have microbes in our gut as well as in our mouth, um, etc. So I think it's really cool to think about the fact that Microbes are everywhere and you know it's not something we can easily see, right? But they are dominating these environments and they're incredibly diverse and they perform a variety of really important functions. So why is this important? Well, to take a step back and think about humans, we know that microbes play an important role in our health, both positively and negatively. So frequently when we talk about microbes or you hear the term bacteria, um, there might immediately be this negative association, right? Because there are bacteria that act as pathogens um, or associated with causing diseases, but there are also a lot of good bacteria that are really important for maintaining our health. Um, and typically when we think about microbes and bacteria and health and those connections, I think it's important to think about it in the entire context. So it's frequently not a case where it's one bacteria 
or one bacterium that's causing the problem, but it's what is going on in the entire microbial community. So our skin isn't dominated by one bacteria or fungi, it's dominated by a community. And the balance of that community in on our skin as well as in our gut is what is connected to things like our health. And in the past decade or so, the scientific community as a whole has made tremendous strides in understanding the human microbiome and its association with health. So there are dozens and dozens of research articles that have come out uh, that have talked about this and frequently many of them might make the popular news, which is pretty cool. I'm just gonna highlight a couple here to kind of make my point. Uh, the human microbiome, excuse me, the human microbiome has been linked to skin diseases, conditions of the gut, such as IBS and Crohn's, and it even impacts our mental health. So there's been a work that has indicated that the microbes in our gut and the chemical compounds those microbes produce are associated with inflammation, and that has a cascading impact on our body and our mental health. Um, and again, just to reiterate, it's not usually one bacteria, and it's not always a bad thing, right? It's usually what's going on with the whole community and whether that community is in balance and we have the good bacteria um, versus if it's out of whack and maybe we have too much of a bacteria that doesn't do such great things. Similar to us humans, corals also host a unique microbiome, which includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, and of course the algal symbionts that give them their beautiful pigmentation. Also like us, there's been research that suggests that when a coral microbiome becomes disrupted or out of balance, that can affect the health of the coral. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, microbes are everywhere, right? And this includes in the ocean. I frequently like to think about the ocean as kind of like this giant bowl of microbial soup, right? So corals have their own microbiome, so their own diversity of bacteria that's associated on them as well as within their tissues, but everything around them has a microbial community or a microbiome as well. So this includes the water column, the sediment or the sand that you can imagine, especially in areas with high wave impact, it's going to interact more with corals, right? If that sand gets stirred up and maybe ends up on top of a coral. There's also things like invertebrates, like sea stars that are moving about, as well as algae and other plants that might be brushing against a coral. And when we think about those interactions, right, you have the coral and the seaweed, for instance, that are interacting, but also the microbes associated with the seaweed and the microbes associated with the coral that are interacting. Um, and there's been some really cool, inter uh, excuse me, really cool research, uh, in particular on fish. So you can see in this image here, a parrotfish right in the center. Um, and there's been uh, some cool work looking at how parrotfish biting corals can actually disrupt the microbial community of corals. And parrotfish mouths in particular, they can transmit pathogens from their mouth onto corals. And if you're interested in that, that was done by Azat et al. a couple of years ago. And of course, nothing exists in isolation, right? Unfortunately, we've seen a decline in our ecosystems and in particular our coral reefs over the past few decades from a variety of factors, including climate change, overfishing and pollution. And it's not just the corals that are being impacted. So when we look at an image like this, where on the top, you have a healthy kind of coral dominant ecosystem on the bottom, this is the same location where it's become a more degraded algal dominant environment. It's not just what we can see again with our naked eye that's shifting the microbial communities are shifting as well. And this has both cause and effect associations. So changes are gonna trigger different microbial communities and those microbial communities and shifts such as this can actually cause feedback loops that make it more difficult for the ecosystem to recover. Or on the flip side, if we have healthy microbial communities, it helps us maintain those healthy ecosystems. So I personally am a glass half full kind of person. So I like to think about the positive side of this relationship. So rather than focusing on you know, the bad bacteria or these negative shifts, how can we tap into our understanding of the positive bacteria and their role in, on coral reefs? And how can we harness that to understand and improve our coral reef health and use it for restoration purposes? So in my time at the Smithsonian, I have kind of focused on two sides of this equation and I'm gonna divide the rest of my talk into those two parts. So first I'm gonna be talking about coral settlement. So how we can use bacteria to enhance metamorphosis and settlement in coral larvae. And then I'm gonna move into talking about this other side of survival. So once we have these newly settled coral recruits or spat, can we use bacteria in the form of probiotics to increase survival? So first talking about settlement, before I delve into this too much, I wanna take a step back and talk about a coral's reproductive lifestyle. 
So corals can uh, reproduce in two different ways. They can asexually reproduce. So if you're familiar with the term coral gardening, this is a common restoration approach where we fragment corals. So you might have a branching coral, for instance, and you cut or break off one of those arms and you can then have two individuals growing and you can move them to different locations to try and increase or enhance coral restoration efforts. Um, and this is great because you're starting with you know, larger chunks of coral essentially that are established colonies. The negative, negative side of this is you have clones, right? So while that can be good if you have a really uh, tough and strong and resilient clone of a coral, if you have a coral that maybe becomes susceptible to disease and all your corals are genetically identical to each other, you know, if one dies, the rest of them are going to die. So that brings in kind of the other cycle or reproductive cycle that corals go through, which is sexual reproduction. So I'm going to depict that here in slides that came courtesy of my colleague Jennifer Sneed. Um, and what you're seeing are there are two different types of kind of coral sexual reproductive modes. So we have broadcast spawners that release gametes into the water column and they undergo external fertilization before they develop into planula larvae. And those planula larvae will then you know, search around, figure out where they want to settle, and they'll settle down here on the bottom where they'll adhere and stick um, as spat or recruits. We also have brooding corals where they do internal fertilization and they'll release developed planula larvae into the water column again, and they'll still go through that same kind of cycle where they're swimming larvae that then will ultimately settle down, adhere, and metamorphose into spat or recruits. And this is the section of the life cycle I'm interested in. So to hone in on that, I think this is really interesting to think about, right? You have these tiny coral larvae that are, you know, part of the plankton essentially, right? We can't really see them with our naked eye too well. They're like pepper flakes, basically, if you're looking at them in a water bowl. Um, and they're swimming around, but they are subjected to the currents. And unlike fish, which can move if they don't like the environment they're in or if conditions change, Corals, once they adhere to a spot, they're pretty much stuck there, right? So how do they decide or how do they make that choice of where they want to settle and what do they respond to? This whole process is driven by cues and it includes a variety of cues. So they might factor in light, they might factor in um, sound or topography, they might uh, factor in things like oxygen amount, uh, but frequently they're responding as well to things like crustose coral and algae, which is a type of algae that isn't the fleshy algae that touches your legs when you're walking through the water, but rather an algae that encrusts. And honestly, if you're snorkeling around and you see a rock that looks like pink or purple or red in hue, it's probably a, um, it's probably a type of CCA or crustose coral and algae. So there's been work for a number of years now that has associated coral settlement with CCA. Um, and I should say, you know, it's not like this consistent response. It's going to depend on the species of coral and it's going to depend on the species of CCA. In addition to the CCA that they're responding to, the CCA, like I mentioned before, right, microbes are everywhere. And the CCA are associated with their own microbes and their own bacterial biofilms. And when I say biofilm, what I mean by that is you're, uh, we're talking about a microbial community that's essentially existing in kind of like a matrix or it's not quite a slime, but uh, I like to think when I think about biofilms, I like to uh, immediately picture, you know, if you never or like if you maybe delayed in cleaning your shower, you might get this like film forming on your shower liner. That's a bacterial biofilm. Um, so something similar, but in this case, you know, not as gross, right? We have good bacteria in a microbial community associated with CCA. And in some cases, the coral larvae are responding to the bacteria rather than the CCA. Um, so it kind of just, again, depends on which coral species we're talking about, which CCA and which bacteria. And ultimately, their response to these biological organisms and deciding to settle or not is driven by chemical cues or compounds. And they could be compounds that are produced by the CCA, or they could be compounds that are produced by the bacteria. So what I'm picturing here is a compound called tetrabromoporol or TBP. This is a compound that my colleague, Dr. Sneed, isolated a few years ago, and it's produced by a bacteria that was originally isolated from a CCA. And we know it rely, reliably triggers metamorphosis and settlement in coral recruits. So just to visually show this process again, um, now that we've talked about cues driving settlement, you could see an adult coral on the top left. They'll release either gametes that fertilize again in the water column, or they'll release developed larvae depending on the life cycle they have. Um, so you can see some coral larvae swimming about here. And, and like I mentioned before, this is an image under a microscope. So when we look at it, 
larvae with their naked eye, they're, they're pretty, pretty tiny. They'll then respond to some type of cue and also factor in, you know, other conditions like I mentioned before, topography, oxygen, inorganic ingredients in the environment, etc. And they'll undergo metamorphosis and settlement. So you can see in this image, this is what a CCA looks like. So you again have this kind of pink rock-like structure. And in this image, you can see a swimming larvae that's kind of attached. So it's kind of begun this process of settlement where it's searching and deciding where to settle, but it's still a swimmer, it's still oblong. Um, and then it will go through this process called metamorphosis where it flattens out. It looks kind of like a flower at that point. So we have, you know, if we zoomed in on this image and I'll show some later that demonstrate this a bit better, but we'll be able to see kind of the development process. So we can see a mouth forming and we can see septa forming, so separation of the tissues. And then ultimately, we hope that the coral will grow up and become its own, you know, successful, strong adult coral. So we can perform different experiments to identify bacteria associated with the coral settlement. Um, so that's what I've been working on the past few years at the Smithsonian. And to start this process, we start by isolating and growing different bacteria. And again, we might pick bacteria that are associated with CCA because we know there's something about the CCA that the corals respond to, or we might pick and grow bacteria that is associated with healthy corals that are maybe resilient to different things like temperature or disease. And then we can test them in a variety of different ways to see if they are associated with coral settlement. So there's a couple different ways we could do this. Like I mentioned, I'm just gonna highlight two different methods here. Uh, the first is something we've been doing more of the past, you know, uh, spawning season or so, where we are testing resuspended bacteria directly. So what I mean by this is we could take this bacteria on the left, we could grow it up in liquid media, so growth media for the bacteria. We can then concentrate it down into essentially a bacteria cell pellet, and then we could take it and we could resuspend it in uh, seawater before directly adding it into these six wall plates that contains sterile seawater and coral larvae. So by putting the bacteria directly in there, we could see, you know, do the coral respond or not. We could also test that same type of bacteria in the form of a biofilm. So like I said, there's been quite a bit of research highlighting that, back, uh, that corals respond to biofilms in particular in marine environments. So if we wanted to grow the bacteria in the form of a biofilm rather than just having the bacteria cells in liquid, we would grow it pretty similarly. So we'd grow that bacteria again in a liquid media, but this time, instead of the bacteria staying by itself, we would put in some type of settlement substrate. So what's pictured here are some ceramic disks. So when you add in a substrate, like a ceramic disk, the bacteria is gonna start forming this biofilm on the surface of the disk. So we could pull the disks out, rinse them off to remove any excess material and put them in a Petri dish to do a bench top assay, where we add, again, seawater and larvae, or we could do it in some other type of system. So we have a system uh, that has kind of a more natural setup where there's water flowing and that kind of thing. So it's less isolated like a Petri dish. We leave the experiments for you know, 24 to 48 hours typically, and we might also check them a subsequent time point later. And when we go back and we score them, we are basically looking at the morphology of the coral larvae. So they all start as swimmers. So we're adding in swimmers that we count out one at a time. Um, and we're just looking, you know, are they all still swimming in each of those wells or each of those Petri dishes? And again, you can see kind of that morphology where they're these oblong swimming larvae, or are, can we consider them settlers? So when I say settler, I mean, you know, it's undergone this metamorphosis process. So now it looks more like a flower. And in this image, you can see more clearly, right? There's a mouth in the center and we see separation in the tissue in terms of the septa forming. And I should say, when we look at this too, when they go through that metamorphosis process, they also kind of flatten down. So they look pretty different um, underneath the microscope. Once we go through and look at whether we have swimmers or settlers, uh, we can then analyze that data, right? So I'm gonna show an example here of what one of our results looks like from one of these studies. So this was just testing that resuspended liquid bacteria. And along the y-axis in this figure, we have proportion metamorphosed. So that's the number of corals that went from that swimmer state to being in that flower state. Um, and then the purple versus green is just whether they're attached to the six well plate or the Petri dish. Um, and typically when they go through metamorphosis, they'll settle and then metamorphose, so they are attached. 
but sometimes in our experiments, we move things around. So they might get knocked off and they might be floating around, um, or for some reason they didn't really um, adhere well. So in this experiment, we were just testing two different strains of bacteria. So we have a bacteria strain called MCH17 and a bacteria strain called PS5. And we're comparing it to our control, which is filtered seawater. So this is larvae in seawater with no bacterial cues added. And you can see hopefully right off the bat that there's a pretty big, big difference, right, from our control to our two different bacteria strains, where in this case, both MCH17 and PS5 resulted in more than 50% metamorphosis and attachment. And with PS5, if we look at it across the board, it's almost 100% metamorphosed in terms of the coral larvae we we're looking at. So that's pretty exciting. Um, again, this is going to vary based on the bacteria you're using, the coral species you're using. So in this case, um, and just to explain the, the title of this figure, CNAT stands for Copophilia neaton. So that's a particular type of coral species we were testing. So this is what we want to see. And you can imagine, you know, in this case, I'm just showing a case where we tested two different strains of bacteria, but we've done this with 10 strains of bacteria, and then we've done it with a couple different species of coral. Um, so we could kind of start honing in on new bacteria that might be producing different cues that we can use to kind of understand what's going on in this process and hopefully use in restoration. So what's the next step? Once we identify the bacteria, then we can begin this process called extraction, where, you, where we wanna pull the chemistry from the bacteria to test for settlement activity. Because if you recall, I mentioned before, right, whether it's CCA or it's bacteria, they're producing something that the coral is responding to. So we want to know about the chemistry. And this process is analogous to if you've ever brewed tea, Coffee is similar, but I think tea is actually a better example. So if you imagine, you know, in this case, we're growing bacteria, which unfortunately this isn't a great picture, but these are really large petri dishes that have lawns of bacteria on them. We scrape that bacteria off, we put it in a vial or a flask, and then we add an organic solvent to pull that chemistry off. So as I mentioned, this is just like brewing tea. If you have a tea bag, right, it's filled with tea leaves, you're putting it in a cup and you're adding hot water, that hot water is acting as a solvent. So right away, if you're looking at this process, you see the pigments coming out of the tea leaves. And we're also pulling out that delicious flavor of the tea, as well as those compounds we really enjoy consuming like caffeine. Um, so we're doing essentially the same thing, but we're doing it with bacteria. Um, and we're not using hot water in this particular case. So once we have this crude chemical extract, so that's like the entire suite of compounds we could pull off with this organic solvent, we can add it into these six well plate assays with sterile seawater and we could add in larvae and we could see is the chemistry still active. So, you know, we know the bacteria is active. Now are we seeing that kind of chemistry driving the settlement activity as well? And once we determine, yes, the crude bacterial extract works, and the corals are responding to that, then we can undergo this process or start this process called bioassay guided fractionation, which is definitely a mouthful, um, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So hopefully you can kind of follow the logic and understand how we go, go about trying to get to identifying individual compounds. So we start with crude bacterial extract. So again, that's this whole kind of suite of chemical compounds. And then we fractionate that. And when I say fractionate, what I mean is we're essentially trying to parse out or pull apart and break apart this mixture of all these different compounds into a few groups of compounds. And there's all sorts of different ways to do this. I'm not gonna go into this too much. I'm just showing right here um, an example where we're doing column chromatography and we separate our chemistry or chemical compounds based on polarity. And then essentially what this is doing, as I said, is you're starting with the crude extract and then you're ending up with multiple vials with fewer compounds in it. So you can imagine if you had a crude extract, say with 40 compounds in it, you might end up with, you know, a fraction that has five compounds, maybe two of them have five compounds, and then you have one with 10 compounds, and then the last fraction has 20. Then we'll test all four of those as well as the crude, and we can see where the activity is to try and kind of hone in on where, um, which compound is driving this process. So I'm just showing an example here. I'm not gonna go into it too much, but it's similar to what I showed before where we're looking at metamorphosis on the y-axis. And in this case, instead of having bacteria strains, we have the chemistry. So we have our controls, we have the crude, which you can see again is triggering um, settlement. And then we have the four fractions. And in this case, activity is being driven by the compounds that were separated and isolated into that first fraction. So once we know this, we, it's basically a process of rinse and repeat where we keep fractionating and testing it in the similar types of assays. 
Um, so you can imagine we end up with these giant flow charts, right, where you have really complex chemistry and then you're getting into groupings and then you fractionate those groupings, you know, so on and so forth until you eventually end up with one individual compound that is responsible for settlement. And I should say that, you know, it might be a case where there might be a couple compounds that are associated with settlement, but we like to try and hone in and identify them as individuals rather than, you know, a group, because then we could start getting at understanding that further. So to just sum up kind of this section of my talk, um, settlement assays are valuable tools when we think about coral reef restoration efforts. So bacteria and chemical compounds, both individually, um, can be used to trigger coral settlement in the lab. And this is pretty handy, right? Because if we want to, you know, spawn coral or collect coral gametes, fertilize them in the lab, we could do something in a controlled setting where we are settling them out, and then we could outplant those coral settlers back onto the reef. Um, and kind of enhance, hopefully, the settlement rates that might be occurring versus what's going on in nature, right, where you have all these different signals, and especially if you have, like, a degraded environment, they might not be receiving the signals they, you know, that cue them to settle. So we could do this in the lab and then outplant those coral settlers or recruits. And this process could be scaled up. So what I was talking about, right, was individual six-well plates or petri dishes, you can imagine, you know, in this case, when we're testing these things at the Smithsonian, we're working with small numbers of coral larvae. So in each of those petri dishes, we might have, you know, 20 larvae or 10 larvae, but this process can ideally be scaled up, right? Once we have a sense of which bacteria, which compounds are driving these processes. Um, so what I'm showing here on the bottom is some work we did, we've been doing with our collaborator, Secor International. So Secor International uh, does a lot of work in terms of trying to settle coral larvae. And the more traditional process that they use and a lot of other reef organizations use when they're working with coral larvae is they use naturally conditioned substrates. So they'll take you know, those ceramic discs, or in this case, say ceramic stars, they'll cart them all out to the reef and they'll leave them on a healthy reef for a set amount of time, you know, a couple of weeks to a few months. And they're essentially hoping, right, that the CCA and those bacteria that trigger settlement are gonna grow and then they'll lug all those substrates back into the lab or you know into some type of field station they have to clean them all to get rid of you know things that the corals don't like like fleshy algae um, before they can you know put them in some type of system like what's depicted here is a coral re rearing basin um, and then they add larvae to it and they hope they settle while this tends to work really well it's very variable in terms of its rate uh rates right so sometimes you might have a good community that grows on the substrates and sometimes not so much. So the benefit of what we're doing is if we can identify individual bacteria or individual compounds, instead of going through this labor intensive process of lugging everything off the reef, bringing it back, cleaning and hoping for the best, we could say, what if we just grow a lot of bacteria and we cover the substrates in that bacteria that cues settlement? Or what if we just directly add a compound? Then maybe we can see more consistent settlement rates um, and higher rates, hopefully, and it's a lot less labor, in time, labor intensive and time intensive. All right, so now that we have these cute little baby coral recruits or spat, you know, we are putting them back out on the reef. Is there a way we can enhance their survival? So that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk is kind of a project uh, Dr. Sneed and I have been working on related to this question and how we can use bacteria to enhance survival. So as I mentioned earlier, coral reefs are facing global decline for a variety of reasons, you know, from climate change to um, overfishing, pollution, and of course, disease as well. And I just wanted to highlight one disease that's been very problematic in Florida and the Caribbean. It's called stony coral tissue loss disease. So this is a disease that first popped up in Miami-Dade County in 2014 before it spread throughout the Florida reef track and is now throughout much of the Caribbean. And this disease impacts over 20 different species of coral and you can see what it does from some of the images on the left. So it results in this rapid tissue loss. So you end up with a lesion that rapidly progresses and frequently results in mortality of corals. So this has been, as you can imagine, pretty devastating to our reefs. So a wide variety of scientists across Florida, the Caribbean, and outside of Florida and the Caribbean have been working on this and trying to figure out how we can combat this, how we can stop this, this disease from spreading. And what my colleagues at the Smithsonian have been working on and doing a great job with is using good bacteria in the form of probiotics. Um, so some of you might be familiar with probiotics. If you take, you know, um, 
a daily supplement that includes probiotics, or even if you just watch TV and you catch all those Jamie Lee Curtis commercials about Activia, because right, yogurts contain probiotics. But to define it, in case you aren't familiar, probiotics are live microorganisms such as bacteria, which when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. So this is something that's not only used in human health, so we're trying to kind of improve our gut health, right, when we use probiotics probiotics, but it's also commonly used in aquaculture. So you could see some instances here of probiotics from fish and shrimp aquaculture. It's also used um, in things like oyster aquaculture to increase survival and health in terms of, you know, the output and the collection of aquaculture. So my colleagues at the Smithsonian in a project led by Blake Ushijima, um, identified and isolated this bacteria called pseudoalterno excuse me, pseudohalteromonas species, uh, strain MCH17. And this, you can see on the left, is a dot of, or colony of MCH17. Um, and when we're identifying and isolating, looking for probiotics, what we kind of typically screen for is we'll put a, a pathogen on a plate like this. And then if you see this kind of clearing zone around it, it means it has antibacterial activity. So it's producing compounds that kills pathogens um, that can impact corals. So MCH17, you can see has this nice zone around it, and that led um, Dr. Ushijima, as well as Kelly Pitts and Valerie Paul and others at the Smithsonian to test this with corals directly in aquaria at the Smithsonian. And I should say that this strain of bacteria originally came from a coral, a healthy coral. Um, so you can see this image on the right, happens when you treat uh, pieces of coral adult fragments with MCH17. So on the top, we're looking at untreated coral. So at day zero and day 11, you could see there's tissue loss going on in this coral at day zero. And by day 11, it's almost entirely dead. Whereas when it's treated with MCH17, the lesion halts or slows um, and it's looking pretty good, right? So that is super promising to the point where we're also doing this in the field. So this is an image taken of Kelly Pitts applying this probiotic to adult corals in the field. And the field results are also looking really promising. So this is really exciting in terms of thinking about using bacteria and the good bacteria associated with corals to kind of help um, make them stronger and more resilient to diseases and other stressors um, in their natural environment. So I, of course, was curious about coral recruits. So if this probiotic is doing such great stuff with adults, can we take that same methodology and apply it to coral larvae and newly settled recruits or spat? Um, and treat them with probiotics and hopefully make them a little more resilient to this disease. So for this, I ran uh, two different iterations of this experiment and I wouldn't have been able to do this experiment at all without my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Sneed, who did everything with me side by side on this and it was um, a lot of work. So I wanna just acknowledge her uh, now before later. Um, so we did this first with Montastria cavernosa coral um, or the great star coral. And then we also ran an experiment with the pillar coral or Dendrogyra cylindris. So the way we set up these experiments is we took coral larvae, and I should say, I might have said it before, but whenever we're running coral experiments, we're counting individual larvae out. So you can see that in the bubble on the left, right? We're counting out like batches of 10 larvae at a time. Um, so you can imagine it takes quite a bit of time and, and eye power. And then we put them into small petri dishes, and then we set up three different treatments. So first we settled all the coral with a settlement queue. So I mentioned before, one of the cues we use is tetrabromal coral, TBP, which was identified by Jennifer Sneed a few years ago. And I think this is a great example of how this project builds off all our work in settlement, right? We can use this cue because we know it reliably triggers metamorphosis and settlement in coral. So it helps us set up these experiments now. So we settled all our coral larvae using TBP, and then we treated with them with the probiotic bacteria MCH17. Um, so we had a control that only had the queue and no bacteria, and then we had kind of two batches that had the settlement queue along with a dose of the probiotic bacteria during that settlement process. And then one of those two were then treated again with another dose of probiotics uh, right before the next step of our experiment. So we ended up with three different types of treatments. So once we had all our coral recruits and we had treated them with the probiotics, we then divided them into tanks or aquaria with either healthy adult corals, fragments, so you can see this on the left, or a fragment of a diseased coral. So you can see the lesion in this particular individual, and we'd imagine that this lesion would progress. So we would not only monitor 
our recruits and look at survival and how they were doing overall. But we would also, every time we looked at the tanks, which was twice a week for two months, we would track the progression of this lesion and kind of look at how the disease was spreading. So just to give you a sense of how the tanks were laid out in each individual tank, we would have the coral and then we would have one dish representing each treatment. So again, we had one where the recruits were only exposed to that settlement queue, no bacteria. We had one where they were treated with the settlement queue and bacteria during settlement, that probiotic bacteria during settlement. And then the third one was the settlement queue, the probiotic, probiotic bacteria during settlement. And then they were dosed again, right before they were essentially put into tanks with this. And I should say like they, you know, the probiotic got rinsed out and everything before. Um, but if anybody has questions about kind of methods and how we think about this or, or set it up, please let me know um, at the end. And Jenny and I would bring these dishes in, you know, twice a week, as I said, for about two months. And what we would look underneath on the scope is at all these little sharpie circles. So within each circle is at least one recruit, usually just one recruit. And you could kind of see them as like these little tiny dots in the center of the circle. So we'd look at them under the microscope. And what we were looking at are the recruits. So they're pretty tiny. And in some cases they haven't taken up or they don't take up their symbionts that are you know, in the water column um, or in the tank, I should say. So they're translucent, which makes it a little tricky to see what's going on. Um, but hopefully in most cases, they you know, take up those symbionts that give them their pigmentation and they're a little bit easier to see. So we go through and we look at all our circles and we check on the status of each of those recruits. You know, Is it still alive or has it died? And we just see skeleton. Now to jump into my results from that, I'm gonna just show results from Montasteria cavernosa first, and then, excuse me, then I'll show results from the Dendrogyra, excuse me, Dendrogyra experiment. <laughs> um, so to orient you to my figure before I put the data up along the y-axis, similar to our settlement uh, graphs, but a little bit different, right? In this case, we have proportion, but it's proportion alive. Um, so how many of those settled recruits are still living? Along the x-axis is the day. So this ran for about two months. So every time we checked it, you know, proportionally how many were still alive. And then there's gonna be three different lines representing the three different treatments, as I mentioned before. So we have that control, and then we have the probiotic with either one dose or two doses. And on the left, I'll show the healthy results first, followed by what happens to recruits when they're exposed to disease. So looking at the recruits that were in tanks or aquaria with healthy adult fragments of M. cavernosa, we can see that overall, I think we did pretty good in terms of survivorship. So after two months, for the most part, we had over 75% survival, and in particular with the control and the probiotic with just one dose, although you can see the control is doing a little bit better. For some reason, in our healthy tanks, uh, we saw a decrease in survivorship when we had two doses of the probiotic. That was pretty unexpected to me and surprising. I have some thoughts on why that might be, but um, if people want to chat about it at the end, I'm happy to discuss further. Now, what happened when we took recruits and exposed them to disease? Well, you can see that it's quite a bit of a different trend, right? So we see kind of more of a rapid mortality and die off. And then towards the end, we had about 50% survivorship. So they did not do as well. And this is significant. So disease exposure negatively impacted the coral recruits. It's probably not surprising, right? We kind of expect that when we expose them to disease, they might die. Um, but what was kind of disappointing is it didn't look like the probiotic helped them for some reason. So in this case, actually, the controls did better. Um, that's, again, this red line versus the corals that the coral recruits that were treated with probiotic. So that was a bit of a surprise in our study. Now, when we ran the same experiment with Dendrogyra cylindris or pillar coral, pillar coral we saw the opposite, actually. So um, right away, you might notice that these are pretty similar, right? And unfortunately, uh, Dendrogyra doesn't do as well um, in the lab in terms of growing. They tend in general, I think, to be a little bit more sensitive, so they have higher mortality rates in these early life history stages. So you can see both healthy diseased, the trend is kind of on the downward side of things. Healthy did a bit better, so around 50% survivorship at the end of two months, um, whereas those exposed to disease were on the lower side, but it wasn't significantly different. And one of the big differences in this experiment is the diseased corals we were using didn't actually really have active disease. Um, so disease didn't really seem to be affecting them. When we look at the treatment though, as I mentioned, it's kind of the opposite result of what we saw with the Montasteric cavernosa recruits. So in this case, the red line, right, is lower than the green line. So corals that were treated with probiotics and in particular, just one dose of the probiotics, 
did better than the treatment portals. So that's exciting in the sense that probiotics helped them, but a little bit confusing, right? Because you know it helped in one experiment and seemed to hurt in the other. So just to kind of summarize everything from this section of the talk, exposure to stony coral tissue lock disease can increase mortality in coral recruits. Um, so that's important to know, not many people have worked on these earlier life history stages in terms of what's going on with stony coral tissue loss disease. We found that probiotic treatment, and specifically using MCH17, so I should say there's other potential probiotics, right, was variable in its effect on our recruits. So the M. cavernosa recruits had decreased survivorship when treated with MCH17, but the D. cylindrus recruits had increased survivorship when treated with one dose of MCH17. Again, there was a bit of a difference in these experiments because in the D. cylindrus experiment, the disease wasn't very active. So even when disease isn't active, it seems like the probiotic was benefiting them in some way in terms of survivorship in our aquaria, uh, aquaria setup. But of course, everything is dependent on you know, lots of different factors. So coral species, probiotic strain, treatment method, you know, like thinking about the timing of treatments, the number of treatments, all those decisions and all those different factors are gonna impact our results. Um, so I think this is kind of a really exciting area of study where there's a lot more work to be done in terms of trying to kind of parse out which probiotics may we want to use, which ones maybe don't work so well, um, you know, does it benefit certain coral species and not others, et cetera. So just to kind of conclude overall, hopefully throughout this whole talk, I haven't lost you too much and rather hopefully I've kind of inspired you about the cool role microbes play and how they can be really beneficial and how studying coral bacteria interactions is really valuable and can help us unlock insight into the roles that bacteria are playing in our coral reef ecosystems. And not only help us understand how we can kind of maintain healthy ecosystems, but can also be used and applied in terms of coral reef restoration efforts. So with that, I just wanna acknowledge my colleagues. I've mentioned Dr. Jennifer Sneed a few times. Um, she worked with me side by side on pretty much all of these projects. Um, and especially with the disease experiment, it was really uh, time consuming and a lot of labor, you know, in intensity, I should say, right? Because we were looking under the microscope for, you know, days on end. So uh, I want to not acknowledge her as well as all my other collaborators, um, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Valerie Paul, who's one of my advisors in my time here at the Smithsonian. Um, all of my collaborators in the lab who have helped with the larval work, you know, this is definitely an effort that takes you know, a lot of a lot of people counting out lots of little larvae for all these experiments and then scoring them. Um, and it's a lot of time spent under the microscope. So there have been a ton of people who have helped with that. I've lifted, listed out um, the people who have contributed a ton of their time to this. Um, we've also had visiting scientists who have been really helpful and it's been great to collaborate with. So, you know, Amanda, uh, Aurora and Mateo uh, who have helped us throughout the summers. Sorry, everybody heard that. Uh, reminder of mine. Um, and then, of course, everybody who's just helped out Smithsonian in general with these various projects. Um, I also want to acknowledge my collaborators who have provided us with coral larvae. So Margaret Miller, Carrie O'Neill at Florida Aquarium, um, and Joanna's lab at Nova Southeastern, and Dr. John Lefchek, who's been helping us out with some of the statistics. And with that, I will take any questions if they haven't already been answered by my awesome collaborators and co-hosts on Zoom right now. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, we do have a series of questions, and it looks like Valerie and Jenny will take turns answering those questions for you. So, um, actually, I was gonna. Uh, there was a few questions in the Q and A that I thought it might be good for everyone to hear. So I was gonna read those out to you, Alyssa, and I'll let you answer those. Sounds good. Okay, great. So Lisa asked um, if you could remind us how long it takes in general for settlement to occur. Yeah, so settlement, it's going to be species specific, um, but that's one of the interesting things I wanted to actually go into more and I realized I kind of skipped over that. Um, but this process, right, you know, it happens only a couple times a year. It's all related to the moon cycle for the most part with coral larvae. Um, and then depending on the species, right, they have like a certain window where they're going to settle naturally in the environment. So for some of them, it might be that they go from that larval state to settling in a couple of days. Some of them, it might take longer. If they don't receive a cue, or maybe they, there's you know, these signals in the environment naturally that you know, are indicative to them that that's not a good place, they might never settle, unfortunately. Um, when we're doing these things in the lab, uh, we typically will 
look at our results after 24 hours. So we use larvae when they're kind of at the point where they're ready to settle. And again, it's species specific. So it might be they're ready to settle after three days um, after being you know, fertilized and turning into larvae, or in some cases, it might take them a little bit longer. It's all very species specific. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, in terms of like their life cycle, it takes them much longer to kind of go from that settled spat individual polyp recruit to growing up. So like just getting, you know, a few polyps and into kind of what we would call a juvenile can take months and months. And to get to an adult coral, I don't, it would, it would take a while. So especially when we're looking at those giant corals, um, if you're snorkeling or scuba diving, that is a, you know, those things are pretty old, you know, a, a couple years at least if you can kind of see a whole colony, right? So hopefully that answers the question. And also if somebody else, one of my co-hosts wants to correct me or add anything, please, please do. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. I think that answered the question. I, my my internet is getting a little unstable, so hopefully I'm coming through. Um, you Holly, are. Holly asked, um, how long do coral microbiomes take to develop? Is there a typical age or size when a young coral's microbiome starts to look like an adult's? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that question, Holly. I am super interested in that question. I would love to work on it. Um, there has been work done by um, people who at the Smithsonian, as well as outside of the Smithsonian, looking at the microbiome in corals in their early life history stages. Um, and for a long time, it looked like, for the most part, we know that brooding corals, so the corals that do internal fertilization, when they release their larvae, they're releasing larvae that have at least some components of the microbiome. We can detect and see that microbial community that's essentially being vertically inherited from the parent, as well as the symbionts, their algal symbionts. But broadcast spawners, it's a little bit of a different story. So when they're getting fertilized in the water column, they aren't starting off with their symbionts. And in terms of the microbial community they're starting off with, our knowledge on that is pretty limited. So initial studies looking and using microscopy didn't actually find much of a microbial community at all. And now more, more research in recent years with sequencing efforts have identified that there does seem to be some of a microbial community um, that the broadcast or yeah, the broadcast spawning larvae have. Uh, but in terms of when it's like fully developed, I think we're still working on that. There is a really cool um, review paper about it that I can send you if you if you want. Um, but yeah, I think our knowledge on that is still pretty limited because our in terms of studying that, a lot of it is limited to what we do in the lab. Um, so I know there's been work, for instance, done in aquaria looking at the effects of say, you know, pH or oxygen. Um, and we see the development of the microbiome in those larvae, but it's influenced or they're just picking up the microbes that are present in this kind of like sterile tank environment. Um, so what's going on in the field, I think is something that would be really great to kind of further look into. Hopefully that answers the question. I'd be happy to talk about that more. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, and I think unless anybody else has any questions and please, if you have any other questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and I will read them out to Alyssa or try to answer them myself. Um, but the last question we have right now in the Q&A is from Lisa and she asked, do you think the difference in results with M. cavernosa versus D. cylindris is because probiotics are species specific? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and what's really interesting about that is um, we definitely think probiotics are species specific, but what I guess is really surprising about our results is the probiotic we were using, MCH17, we got from a Montasteria cavernosa adult um, or isolated it from a Montasteria cavernosa adult. So I was expecting to see a benefit if, you know, with nothing else with the Montasteria cavernosa recruits, uh, but it didn't seem to benefit them in that experiment where it did seem to benefit the, dendri uh, the dendrogyra cylindris. Um, and we do know some probiotics in aquarium study with adult corals, you know, we can use different strains of probiotics from different corals um, that may or may not, you know, have an advantage depending on the different species and which probiotic it is. So it seems very species specific, but in this case, kind of the opposite results. I think what might have happened in terms of our results with the Montasteria cavernosa, and in particular with um, the two doses of the probiotic, is I think in that case, um, you know, it kind of made them, I think it might have made them a little more attractive to things like ciliates. Um, so maybe, you know, like the timing of the dosing and what's going on with the, the coral and the other organisms in the tank, you know, we tried to combat everything we saw 
Um, so if we saw ciliates, you know, we like we tried to get rid of them to the best of our ability. But that's something I wonder, in particular, with that two dose treatment. It seemed like occasionally we would see ciliates. You know, in one tank we'd see them in the dish with the coral recruits that had received the most probiotics. And in the same aquaria, they weren't in the little dishes with the control or with the one dose. Um, so yeah, I think figuring out that balance, and I think it also likely plays into Kali's question about the microbiome and what else is going on uh, would be valuable. But yeah, it's species specific. I'm not sure what happened with the MCAV using an MCAV probiotic. Okay, if there are no other questions, I think we'll wrap this up. Um, this session was recorded, so if anybody asks any of the participants, um, it should be available on the SME um, YouTube at some point in the near future. Thank you, Alyssa. That was uh, very informative. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.